Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good? All right. I would just like to welcome everyone with us here in the pews and online. Thanks for joining us this morning. So, once again, we ask that everyone fill out the connection card in your seat before the end of the service. So before the end, the end of the service, that gives you a lot of time. And they provide pencils. And it only takes like 20 seconds. So, it's really easy. You just put it in the black boxes and you'll be done. This helps us know who is here each week and how to best keep in touch with you. And we encourage that you take out your phone right now. We won't judge you for taking out your phone in church, don't worry. And follow our social media accounts listed on the screen. And we want to stay connected with you during the week. And one of the best ways to do that is through our social media. And you can find information on what's happening at CBC, see videos from Pastor Phil and Pastor Josh, and a lot more. Students, be here tonight at 6.30 to talk about the importance of vibrant community. We pray that God builds a community in student life that is saturated in gospel, truth, and love for Jesus and each other. And the new student t-shirts are in, which is really exciting, and they're really pretty. So be here tonight and get one of those. And also on September 26th, there will be color wars happening. More details are coming soon, but plan on joining us for that. And I'm really excited for that, too. That sounds fun. And there will be a special business meeting next week right after the uh, worship in the Monroe Fellowship Room. Members will be voting on placing the Life Center building up for auction. The Life Center building is right over here across from the church. And we encourage all church members to attend. So now please stand and worship with us. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief Sing this out I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. Yeah. 
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than Turn shame into glory. 
Amen. How many of y'all happy we have a king that we can serve today? Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of y'all glad to be here today? Yeah? Amen. You go ahead and be seated. Uh, when I was growing up, I went to a, a you know, pretty conservative church, and every Saturday morning, we would go door knocking. How many of y'all ever did that in your church growing up? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really prepared me well for rejection uh, as a child. <laughs> Uh, getting a job wasn't that hard, you know, uh, after knocking on someone's door you never met before. Not to mention, uh, you can look up Coatesville, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, at some time. And I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, getting dropped off on a street, bus driver driving away, me and some other random dude knocking on uh, some very sketchy houses. So why did I tell you that? For one, uh, just to show off a little bit. That's how brave I am. <laughs> no. But really why I told you that is, you know, it had varying results. Uh, there was times where people were interested in hearing about Jesus. But today, if you came and knock on my door, I'm going to shut the lights off, right? It's just not how we are anymore. We're assuming someone wants to sell us something or stab us, one or the other. Uh, so today, the equivalent of that is sharing on Facebook, right? Right? We have people in the auditorium today that their first interactions with our church came from you sharing it, them watching it online, and then them coming and showing up. Josh uh, went to the school the other day. I think it was at Bird, uh, their open house. And he was just there like rooting on the students. And a lady came up to him because she saw the CBC logo on his shirt and said, hey, I've been watching you guys for the past year. I uh, haven't ever gotten to come yet. I'm just not ready to be in person yet. But uh, when things get a little bit less crazy, I'm going to be there. And he ha she had two teenage daughters, and uh, she's excited to come. So here's the point. We used to get, at the beginning of this, about 30, 35, 40 shares from people uh, just like you in this room. Lately, it's been like 12. And I just want to make sure you understand how important that is. Because if you've got 500, 600 friends and you share that on your Facebook, there's a chance for someone to learn about Jesus and to come to know them. So get your phone out. Share the, uh, the live stream right now. Go ahead. And, uh, and we'll make sure that we get the gospel into the dark reaches of the Internet, right? It needs a little bit more gospel in that arena. <laughs> Hey, I heard somebody just turn. Yeah, that's awesome. Good job. Someone just uh, clicked on it and I heard the volume. That was awesome. Don't be embarrassed. It's great. Yeah, there it is. See, you hear it. Let's see if I can say hello to myself. Hello. Uh, it might be too delayed. <laughs> nice try. Hey, go ahead and say uh, while you're on there, say hi to the people online. We've got somewhere around 35 to 40 people online that are there with us. Uh, your friends, your church members, for whatever reason, they're at home today. Some are even at work watching online as well. So, hey, this is the new age of the world that we live in. And we can't get around it. We can't uh, ignore it either. So let's go ahead and dismiss our kids. And uh, we've got Miss Carrie back there underneath that uh, door frame wearing the TLS shirt, CBC Kids shirt. That's the K through 2. Uh, headed out to the kids church and then we got miss heather all the way in the back for those of you in the loft and uh they'll have a great time got a brand new air hockey table back there for them in the loft so uh, we're excited about that how many of you have an embarrassing picture from back in the day <laughs> yeah right yeah i've got a picture and it just so happens to be my oldest brother's wedding picture which had to be something that would be around forever right uh, but I've got the biggest bowl cut you could ever see in your whole life. Parted right down the middle, shaved basically on the sides. Uh, if you find it, it'll be very embarrassing to me. But look, that's how life works, right? Things that were cool yesterday are no longer cool today. Uh, the shoes that we saved up mowing grass all through high school to buy those shoes, they're most likely no longer around anymore. The computer that we wanted so bad 15 years ago is a brick sitting in our garage somewhere. It's like that with everything. Everything we own will one day either be thrown in the trash or passed on to someone else. Now, materials items aren't bad, but they 
uh, don't last. We always want and we always feel like we need more. In the Gospels, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay your treasures up in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. See, Jesus affirms that everything we own, every material item we have will eventually disappear or go out of, uh, out of style. But with God, what we give to him, those things will last for all eternity. It tells us to lay up our treasures in heaven. So as today, what we think about, those of you in person and online, what God wants us to do in this offering today, don't believe the lie that once you give, it disappears. When you give to God, that has a long-lasting, eternal consequence. When we give to God, he takes our gifts and uses it to extend his kingdom. All of our stuff will one day disappear, but the treasures that we store up in heaven will last forever. So let's us reflect on this as we pray over our offering this week. Dear Jesus, I pray you help us to be people with eternal uh, perspective, God. Help us to see uh, when we look at our lives that it's bigger than just this. It's further than just the things that we hold in our hands. God, I pray that you would help us to remember that there's another life and there's another place. And we're almost there, but we're not there yet. God, I pray you take care of this church. Lord, help us to be the gospel witness in this community that you want us to be. And I pray that you would help us to join in in your generous spirit, God, and be cheerful givers. In your name we pray, amen. You know how to give here uh, in person with our little black boxes, also online, on the app. So many ways to make that easy on us. All right. How many of you enjoy waiting? How many of that's just the most fun thing that you could ever do? How about those of you online? Is that something you like to do? Call waiting. This last week, I've been on the phone with AT&T, you know, a million times, and they put me on call waiting. I hate that. I can't stand it. What about waiting rooms where you're waiting for the doctor and you're a little bit nervous? Maybe it's waiting in line. You get into Disney World or, uh, you know, Six Flags or something like that, and there's a three-hour line to go on a 30-second roller coaster. Waiting is tough. None of these things are any fun. And one of the hardest times for Tori and I waiting was when we candidated for this church. Uh, it was a hard time for us because uh, as far as we were concerned, God wasn't moving fast enough. We felt God moving in our lives, but didn't like how long he was taking. It's hard for us to be in the in-between. It's hard for us to be Patient. It's hard to, for us to say, God, I trust you when I'm ready to move, but he's not. The Old Testament Habakkuk prophet this, uh, that we know of knew a little bit about waiting. And that's where we're going to be today in the book of Habakkuk. How many are excited about that? Have you ever heard a message preached from the book of Habakkuk? Yeah, it's awesome. See, this is around the time... Uh, a little bit before the book of Esther that we jumped into last week. Esther, we talked about the fall of the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel and how that's why Esther lived in Babylon that then turned into Persia after Babylon fell. So rewind a couple hundred years earlier and Habakkuk was a prophet living in those final decades of the southern kingdom of Israel known as Judah. And later, like we've mentioned, the Babylonians conquered it around 600 years before Christ. But in this country of Judah, idolatry and wickedness and injustice ran rampant in the land. And many of the minor prophets that are at the end of the Old Testament, they addressed the sin of Judah directly, warning them of the consequences that were going to come from their sin. But here in Habakkuk, we don't see him, this prophet, speak directly to Judah. Instead, we get a glimpse of a conversation between Habakkuk and God. And big questions are asked in this book. 
Big questions that you might have felt in your lifetime as well. Is God good when evil and tragedy are so common? Why do the wicked seem to get away with their sin? Why do innocent people suffer? These are the questions that are asked by Habakkuk. And he's very honest with God. He brings his complaints right to God. He sees injustice in the world and he wants God to do something. And Habakkuk shows us that our questions shouldn't push us away from God, but closer to him. When you look at the world today in this uh, first chapter, in verse 2, see if you resonate with Habakkuk's words as he cries out to God for answers. Habakkuk 1, 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contentions arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Wait a minute, Habakkuk. You can't talk to God like that, right? But we get an inside look of this struggle that Habakkuk is having with the evil that he sees in the world and the goodness that he knows uh, that is God. And he's got questions. These two things don't seem to add up. He says, oh God, how long will we have to wait? How long shall I cry out for your help? Sin and violence are all around me and it seems like you're doing nothing. Sorrow and suffering abound and the law seems to be paralyzed, ineffective. Justice is broken. And the people that are in charge of bringing justice have perverted it. Habakkuk's hurting for the hurting people around him. And he knows that Judah is wicked and in trouble. But here's the important thing. You might say, well, Habakkuk, that year seems like you're you know, being a little harsh with God, maybe even a little bit disrespectful. But here's the thing. Habakkuk knew who to take his problems to. He took his problems to the one that could do something about it. See, too often those questions that we have keep us away from God. And we hold those things in our heart and we become bitter at God and we become angry at God. But Habakkuk says, God, I love you and God, I know you're good. Why do these things not add up? And Habakkuk took it to the one that could do something about it. And here's the awesome thing. We don't see God throw down a lightning bolt and hit Habakkuk, right? We don't see him, you know, just ream him out. God answers Habakkuk. But it's probably not the answer that Habakkuk was looking for. Habakkuk 1.5. God tells him, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. Even when God's silent, he is working. And God says, look, I am doing some things that you wouldn't even understand if I told you. I'm working behind the scenes to solve this problem of wickedness, of a country that has turned its back on me. But in the next few verses, he goes on to say, God says, look, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, or in other words, the Babylonians. And they're a fast and a fierce army. Violent army, they're meaner than wolves and faster than lepers, and they laugh at every fortress. This wicked army worships their own strength as their God. God tells Habakkuk of this future fall of the southern kingdom, and, and that's where we saw Esther, right? After all of that, the hands of the Babylonians are going to come and wipe out Judah. This is not the justice that Habakkuk was looking for. See, we often want justice to pour out on everyone else except for when we're the one on trial, right? Then we want mercy. Habakkuk says to God, wait a minute, Judah is wicked, yeah, but the Babylonians are way worse. 
God, you know they're even more wicked than us. Why are you using them to judge us? We like to play that game, right? We put up our defenses and deflect our sin by pointing out the sin of others. Habakkuk says in verse 13, You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk says, look, wait a minute, God. Why are you using these wicked people for your purpose? When I asked uh, for help and I asked you what was going on, this wasn't what I was expecting. These Babylonians, they don't even worship you. They are pagan. They don't follow you. But God's showing Habakkuk that Judah doesn't follow him either. They've turned their back on God and they've fallen headlong into sin. And Habakkuk wrestles with the why of all of this. Why, God? Now I've got answers, but now I'm even more confused than I was before. Pastor Terry Streeter preached a message on this next portion, and it helped me a lot when looking through this. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, we see what Habakkuk does next. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post, station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. See, many times when we have these questions, we have complaints, we have issues, when we have doubts, when we have fears, we often never slow down long enough to take the things to God and then wait, wait, wait for the answers. We're impatient. We don't like waiting. We have this tendency to believe that if God doesn't answer right away, that it means he won't answer at all, but that's not true. Waiting is a common struggle for God followers throughout history, waiting for deliverance, waiting for the Messiah, and now waiting for Jesus to return. The lyrics to that song that we sing are true. Even when we don't feel it, he's working. Even when we don't see it, he's working. And he has proven that throughout history. And it's true in your struggle today. So wait on the Lord. Habakkuk goes up to this tower where the guards of the city would watch for enemies. And he literally waits for God to tell him what's going on. And he's looking for God uh, to help. God, why are you letting wickedness run rampant in Judah? And why are you going to judge Judah with a country that's even more wicked than we are? He lodges this complaint with the one that can do something about it. And then he waits. We don't know how long he waited. For us, it's the difference between verse 1 and verse 2. But who knows how much time was in between before God answered him. In my life, it's been very rare that God has answered me in my heart without a significant time of waiting. Maybe it's because my brain is too noisy with fears, or maybe I haven't decided yet that I would follow God if he gave me the answer that I didn't like. You know, God, you tell me what you want to do first, and then I'll decide what I want to do. But he's either God or he's not. And his way is always better than our way. In verse 2, God tells Habakkuk to grab a pen and paper, but he's about to give him a message. He says, write this down. Verse 2, up on that tower, Habakkuk answers, uh, gets answered from God. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may uh, run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to its end. It will not lie. Check out this next part. It says, if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God says, here's your answer. You can trust it. And when it seems like the answer's not happening, don't worry. It may be slow, but it's not because it's late. Wait for it. 
God would use the, the Babylonians to judge Judah for their sin. And it may have taken years, but it will happen, and it did. But next week, we're going to see the second half of this book. And we're going to see that God answers Habakkuk. And he promised to them that the Babylonians would also be judged for their sin. And it may take years, but it will happen. And it did. Babylon would fall and the wicked would be punished. So let's pull out four things in this text that we get to see about God. The first is this. God knows the future. God knows the future. God gave Habakkuk a picture, what was coming next, a vision. God had a plan. But see, too often in our personal lives, in our churches, we try to gather ideas from everyone around us what to do. And we uh, talk about it constantly and we worry and then we try and come up with a plan. And many times we don't take the time to wait on God to give us the answer. But see, what if the answer that God has for us doesn't make sense? What if the answer is for David to face Goliath? No friend group or committee is going to tell you to do that. With our friends as humans, we like to bring people back down to earth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that God could use you to change the world, but have you thought about a job that maybe paid a little more? Instead, we should tell people that purpose trumps paycheck every time. Take the job that God is leading you to. Why? Because either he is God or he is not. God knows the future and he has the answers. Habakkuk knew who to take his doubts to and his fears and his questions to. And then he waited on God and God gave him the answers. As a church, we ought to be asking ourselves constantly, what are God's goals for our church and where do I fit in? Are God's goals for us to have a big bank account or a pristine campus or to have a bunch of programs that make church members more comfortable? Is that what God's goal for us is? Or is it to worship and gather together to lift up his name and to grow and live in gospel community and relationship with each other and to give and serve on mission together? Where do I fit into those goals? How are you working those things out in your life? God has the answers. God has a plan. He knows the future. God has a vision of what happens next. And I can tell you these things. The vision that God has for your life and for our church is to see unchurched friends come to God. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish. It includes seeing the poor and the hurting people in the community being helped, motivated by the love of Jesus Christ. These are things that we can be sure that are in God's plan for us. It includes the gospel message pushing into every dark corner of this county. And we must also remember that God never contradicts himself. God has given us his word. God's given us the Bible. And he will never tell us to do something that conflicts with this book right here. God is never going to lead you and, and direct you to lie to your spouse. It's just not going to happen. But you have, have you asked God where you fit in? Are you willing to wait on the answer? Are you willing to accept the answer when God gives it to you? God knows the future. And God is able to do bigger things than we ever can think he could. Even when it looks rough. Even when it looks hard. Even when things aren't going the way that we wish they would. God can do bigger things than we could ever imagine. It tells us that in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think. According to the power at work within us. God is infinitely creative and he can come up with far better solutions than we could ever imagine. And he knows the future. Number two, God's answers have a time. Habakkuk 2, 3, he said, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. 
See, sometimes God speaks to our hearts and gives us answers for things that aren't right now. God began moving in my heart about taking steps towards becoming a senior pastor six years before it ever happened. I felt God moving me to, to go ahead and uh, begin a master's degree in pastoral theology. And I did that, even though I, I thought it was kind of weird. And then uh, God began uh, to move in my heart three years after that to begin pursuing that. And then it was a year after that. But too often we get bogged down. And it was hard. I'm not saying that I have it all figured out. And it's often times where things look like, you know, maybe I heard that wrong. Maybe God wasn't really doing that. And things get tough. See, God's answers have a time. Don't get lost in the weeds. Don't give up in the waiting. Prepare now for what God is calling you to do tomorrow. So what answers has God already given you that you have given up on already because it's taking too long? Maybe there's time to pick those things back up. Maybe it was a long time ago God began moving in your heart about starting some type of ministry or starting a life group or, or going and doing something, a mission. I don't know what it is, but it took too long and you gave up on it. What are those things that God's already answered you about? Prepare now for what God's calling you to do tomorrow. Maybe there's still time to pick those things back up. See, we can't rush God's will. Everything has a season. God knows the future. God's answers have a time. Number three, don't give up on the answers. Wait for it. Habakkuk 2.3, he says, if it seems slow, wait for it. It surely will come. It will not delay. Judgment was coming for the wicked Babylonians, but it was going to come after the judgment that was coming for the wicked people of Judah. Don't give up when evil seems like it's going to win. See, we know the end of the book. God wins. We have the victory in Christ Jesus. Don't get discouraged when you look out on this world and you think to yourself, I don't understand what God's doing. I don't get it. The government did this, or uh, the, the society's doing this, or the culture's doing this, and it seems like there's no way out. It seems like it, evil has won once and for all. Don't give up on the answers. Wait for it. Prophet Jeremiah had these same questions that Habakkuk had in Jeremiah 12.1. You can see Jeremiah kind of reassuring himself and really telling himself that God's righteous, right? You ever do that where it's like, I know you're good, God. I know you're good. And you're not telling him, you're telling your own heart, right? Well, Jeremiah says, righteous are you, Lord. And when I complain to you, yet I will plead my case before you. And then he gets down to the truth. He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? In your job, at your work, it may seem like the people that have the least integrity and the least character are the ones that get promoted the fastest. But do right. Choose to do what's right. And that God will put you where he wants you to go if you will follow him. Remember that purpose trumps paycheck every time. No amount of money is worth sacrificing your integrity. Parents, you may wonder sometimes how much your kids are catching of what you're trying to teach them. Every time this subject of doing what's right comes up, this song from my childhood comes back into my mind. And it says, do right till the stars fall. Do right till the last call. Do right when no one else will stand by you. Do right when you're all alone. Do right though it's never known. Do right since you love the Lord. Do right, do right. Don't give up on the answers, even when you have to wait. Wait on the Lord. Abraham waited 25 years for his son, Isaac. David waited 17 years for God to, uh, after God told him he was going to be the next king, till it happened. 17 years. The Jewish people waited 42 generations for the Messiah. And we have waited over 2,000 years for Jesus to come back. Wait on the Lord. Waiting isn't bad. 
Waiting can push us closer to Christ. That brings us to number four. Have faith. God knows the future. God's future has a time. And the answers have a time. Don't give up on the answers. Wait for it and have faith. Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. He's talking about the wicked and the evil that look like they're going to win. It's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Waiting is hard. Have faith. Even when it doesn't look like he is moving. Have faith. But why? Why are these things happening? Tony Evans tells us that the book of Habakkuk prompts us to look at the who when we don't understand the why. Look at the who when you don't understand the why. Remember who God is. God is good. God is powerful. God is in control. And I will have faith and I will trust him even when I don't understand the why. And when the why doesn't make sense, remember who God is. The enemy may be puffed up and he may have uh, thought he had won in your life in this world. But the righteous, it says, shall live by faith. Even if you don't have the answer yet. And even when the answer doesn't make sense. Or even when the answer isn't for today. Have faith. Faith. Why? Because you know who God is. The New Testament echoes this phrase in Galatians and Romans and Hebrews when it says the just shall live by faith. And that's not a one-time action. That's not the just will decide to live by faith one day. It's a constant reminder for your heart to have faith, to live by Buy it. That's my motto. Even when things are rough, even when things are scary, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to live by it. It's a, a way of life. It's choosing every day to remember who you are and whose you are. Because if you're a follower of Jesus today, you're his and he will take care of you. So start to live like it. Live like God wants to take care of you. Faith is belief in action. It's one thing to say, I believe in God. and It's another thing completely to say, I believe that God is good. I believe that God is in control and he is powerful enough. And then I'm going to take steps in my life based on that belief. Faith is taking steps when you don't have the full picture. So keep walking, have faith. Remember back to the beginning, Habakkuk started this conversation with God like this. He said, oh God, how long shall I cry for your help and you will not hear? God heard his cry. He heard his doubts. He heard his fears. He heard his complaints. And God reminded Habakkuk that he knows the future. He has the answers. His answers have a time. Not to give up when the answer doesn't seem like it's for right now. And to wait. To wait for it and have faith. It's even harder in this situation because the plans that God had were not what Habakkuk was hoping for. Habakkuk, I think, was praying for revival to happen in his country. For people to turn their ways back to God like we see in the book of Jonah in the country of Nineveh. Where Jonah comes and says this like shortest message ever recorded. Like repent. And they're like okay. Sometimes that's not what happens. And sometimes what actually happens is judgment falls because the people won't repent. But judgment is a mercy as well. Because judgment is during our lifetime. When we still have a chance to turn around, God says, get right. And we have a chance to do it. It's God honking the horn as we're about to drive off a cliff. Instead of just letting us drive off to our own destruction. And if judgment has come in your life because you won't turn around, it's a blessing. It is a mercy for God to try and get your attention today. 
And that might happen for us as a country, as a world. There may be times where we're going to pray for God to turn the ship around and God's going to say, look, I hear what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But what's actually going to happen is judgment. And you're going to have to trust that I'm good and that I am in control and that I know what I'm doing. These plans that God had were not what Habakkuk was hoping for, but he trusted God. It's hard to wait. It's hard being in that in between. It's hard to be patient. It's hard to say, God, I trust you when you're ready to move, but God isn't ready. But here's the point. Take your fears and questions to God every time. Wait on him. And when you get the answers, prepare for the next season. If you know it's going to rain, you're going to bring your umbrella. So, hey, today, start getting ready for what God's speaking to your heart about. Take steps and then wait for it. Now, in our lives, in everyone's life, ultimately, Jesus is the answer to every single one of our problems. And praise God when we accept that gift of salvation. Wicked people like me don't always get the punishment that we deserve. Jesus took my place. How can you help but love and follow a God like that? You know, I wish every message was everything is going to be okay, right? I wish every message could be if you just, you know, have faith that you're going to, your bank account's going to fill up. And you're going to be healed right away. And no loved one's ever going to die. But it's not true. It's not what the Bible tells us. And so I have to preach messages like this that say, hey, you're going to be disappointed sometimes. There's going to be times where those fears do come true. There's going to be times when you're in a dark place. And you're going to have to wait there. But Habakkuk teaches us what's to do when that happens. And if we don't talk about this, then when we get in those places, we think it's all about us. Well, maybe God hates me. Maybe I wasn't, didn't have enough faith. But that's not always what it is. Sometimes the thing is, is that life is hard. Sometimes our hopes and dreams are dashed. But we see here with Habakkuk, he teaches us what to do. Who to go to. You take your doubts and your fears and your complaints straight to the God that can do something about it. And maybe he doesn't calm the storm around you, but maybe he calms your heart in the middle of a storm. And that's just as much of a miracle. Take your fears and your hardships and your concerns to God. Don't get angry. Don't get bitter. Don't be scared to talk to him about these times where you're like, God, I don't get it. It feels like you ought to be doing something in this situation and you're not. And that doesn't make sense to me. That is a sincere prayer. And that is a prayer that God honored Habakkuk for. And God gave Habakkuk some answers. And maybe that's really what's keeping us from God. Is we're putting on a facade as if everything's okay. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. When on the inside, we're like, God, I don't get what's going on in my life. Have faith. Take your answers to the, uh, your questions to the one that can do something about it. Might not answer you the way that you expect him to answer you. The answers that he gives you might not be for right now. It might be after a long period of waiting. But when you don't understand why, remember the who. God is good, God is powerful, and God is in control. Have faith. With every head's bowed and eyes closed. Heavy message today. But we remember that ultimately... All of our answers are found in Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And every fear and doubt finds its answer in the cross. 
All sin and all brokenness, all hurt, pain, death, fear, all of it is answered on that hill called Calvary. Because Jesus defeated it all. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus today as the only means for your salvation, then you can look forward to a victory when all those questions are answered. Have faith. Follow Jesus today. Dear Jesus, we love you. God, I pray you would help us always to run to you when we have doubts and questions. Instead of just going and taking a poll of popular opinion, God, I pray that you would help us to take our questions to you. And then wait. And listen. Be honest. Pray for that one today that has had these deep questions in them that they've been afraid to ask. Maybe it was because of the death of a loved one. Maybe it was because of a diagnosis or a job that they were let go from or even just, God, what are you doing with this pandemic that we're in? What is going on? What are you doing with this social unrest? Culture seems broken. People constantly are turning their back on you. We can begin to get impatient and lose hope. God, help us not to let these questions put distance between us and you, but rather draw us in closer. We trust you. Maybe you're here today and you don't know for sure that you are a God follower, a Jesus follower. You can't go back and look in a time in your life when you understand that you needed a Savior You can't remember a time where you called out to God and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm not good enough because I'm not perfect. I know that sin broke the world and I've participated in it. And because of that, I need that gift that you gave us on the cross, that gift called salvation. Jesus in my place paying the debt of my sin maybe that's you right now need to call out to God once and for all you might not have all the answers you might not know everything but you believe today that Jesus is enough you call out to Jesus right now words aren't important not a magic prayer you could call out with something like this dear Jesus I know I'm a sinner. And I know because of my sin that I deserve hell. God, please forgive me. I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to you. I put my faith in what you did on the cross your death, your burial, your resurrection. And I believe that you paid the wages of my sin. Please save me. If that's you today, I'd love you to reach out to me, whether it's you know, just telling me here in person in just a few minutes or through an email or through Facebook or something. You just let me know, hey, I made that choice today. I wasn't playing games with God. I made that choice once and for all. I'd love to tell you what's next. Let's all stand. We'll sing and take time to worship this God. You're in that waiting today and you're in those questions today. This is a perfect time to let those things go and to give them to God and to worship Him. I love you, Lord. 
Oh, your mercy never fails me No, my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice I mean, all that's true in your life, that all your life, God has been faithful. Amen? Yeah. I want to assure you that even in those waitings, when I look back at those times in my life where it's been rough and it's been hard and I didn't have the answers, it has never been sweeter in my relationship with God than in those times where I knew I didn't have any answers in and of myself. So be rest assured that there is peace and comfort and hope even in the waiting. Hey, we love you. 
Clarksburg Baptist Church. Those of you online, we thank you so much for jumping on with us. Hey, tell someone about uh, Jesus this week. Hey, invite them to come to, to church with you, whether online or in person. Let's get the hope of the gospel out there into the world. We'll see you next time.